Hey guys, this is part two of three video on the valve cover replacement for the following 3MG FE engine cars. In the first video, I showed step-by-step -step instructions on all the parts that you had to take apart, move aside, or completely remove in order to be able to remove both front and back valve covers. Since this is a fairly big DIY job, this is the perfect time to also do some important maintenance work because you already have everything taken apart. Therefore, in this second video, I'm going to cover all the maintenance work that I performed. If you want to skip additional maintenance work and jump right to the reinstallation steps, then please wait for my part three video, which I hope to finish editing within one or two weeks. I forgot to include the front valve cover removal in the first video, so I'll add it here. So this front valve cover is easy. Uh, we have nine 10 millimeter bolts. There's one hidden under there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then ninth one is there. I loosened all the bolts first and then used the power tool to remove them. They look like this. I'm going to just temporarily tie this on this side uh, just to get it out of the way. Okay, that'll help to uh, work on this without constantly juggling that up out of the way. The rubber valve cover gasket shrunk. So on some of these corners, I actually see a slight gap. I can see why the oil is leaking. Ah. Quick warning. I flipped over the valve cover to show it in the video, but please do not do this right over the camshaft area as I heard something drop and there are holes that goes down to the head section below. Oops, shoot. I think the uh, these things here came out of here when I flipped it over. Uh-oh, hopefully I can find those. This is simply amazing that after 215K miles on this 3MZ FE engine, the camshaft gears and bearings appear to be in really good shape and I don't see any metal shavings. By the way, note the silicon gasket remains on both left and right edges, which we'll also have to apply before installing new gasket. Before installing the gasket, be sure to clean the gasket mating surface. I used a flat razor blade to scrape off the dust and dried up silicon. I'm doing this very carefully to not scratch the surface. Afterwards, I spray some brake parts cleaner on a towel and wipe off the surface. Use a small pick or screwdriver to remove the gasket. Note that this gasket has dried up and shrunk in height and it's no longer flexible. This is why oil was leaking. For the spark plug tube seals, I was trying to be gentle in removing them but it really took some force to get them out. This is what came out. So I didn't know this piece had a, a spring inside. And then this here, I thought it would be a uh, rubber, but it's actually metal inside. Because of the rigid metal ring around the tube seal, I had to use more force than expected. I tried to bend the metal tab that holds the tube seal in place, but couldn't do it with the tube seal getting in the way. So in the beginning, I was using both a screwdriver and a plier to kind of break it into pieces to get it out. But by the time I got to the third one, I found that if you hammer wedge in a thin flathead screwdriver on one of the edge, you can then just bend the inner metal ring and pluck out the tube seal easily in one piece. For the backside valve cover, I tried using the seal puller pick tool, but that also pulled out the inner part only and I still had to use a flathead screwdriver to get the outer ring out. So don't bother buying one of these if you don't have one. A flathead screwdriver works just as effectively. This is the old gasket. Look at how rigid this is. I can hold it like a stick. And this is the new gasket and of course it's very flexible. Let's try measuring the thickness. Let's see, the old one is 6.7. The new one is almost nine. So you see why the old one wasn't sealing it well. Wow, there's no, I don't feel any tension. I mean, this is so loose. Wow, 
Oh my gosh. It's almost as if I already loosen. None of these are tight. Oh my gosh. You see, something strange. These bolts should be tight. It's loose. No wonder it's leaking oil. few rubber hoses during this project were so brittle and they don't flex anymore so only way to get them out is to break it so I left this one on there. For the outer cover cleaning I used both brake parts cleaner and engine degreaser sprays and then wiped off the grease and dust buildup with paper towel. I repeated spraying cleaning solutions and then wiping off the dirty buildup several times until the surface was clean. For the inner part of the valve cover, I repeated the same process of spraying the engine degreaser and then letting it soak for 5 minutes and then brushing off all the gunk buildup. I repeated this few times until it was mostly clean and then gave it a good shower outside. I'm doing this full clean because I'm very meticulous. But if you're in a hurry, the only important areas that you need to really clean thoroughly are where the gasket and spark plug tube seals will be installed to. This is the front one. I took more time to clean this. This is the back one. For the spark plug tube seals, you have to first bend back the small metal tab so that tube seal can be installed. Tube seals are a bit tight to install. So I applied some fresh oil on the round edges and I used rubber mallet and 30 millimeter deep long socket to lightly tap them in place. It's highly important that you install the tube seal in a correct direction with smoother edges facing you like shown in the video. Once all three tube seals are installed, don't forget to bend the little tap back down again because that's what's going to hold the tube seals when the valve cover flips upside down after the install. For the outer gasket, the installation is pretty obvious, but note that the shape of front and back valve covers are different. So if one doesn't fit, try the other one without trying to force the wrong one to fit. So even after putting back the valve cover, connecting all the back brackets, installing the spark plug, connecting all the connectors, look how much tools and parts I still have left. Okay, I still have the uh, another valve cover here. So keep it organized, because uh, after a while, how are you gonna figure out where all the bolts go, right? They're all gonna look similar. So keep it organized from the start, otherwise it's gonna be a big mess. This is the front side that I cleaned, but. You see, the back side, you can't quite clean as well without taking it out. So I'm gonna clean the back side. Throttle body has two parts, and this is the inner part that connects to the intake platinum. I just took apart everything and cleaned it with chem dip and throttle body cleaner and then finished it with brake parts cleaner. Note that there were two gaskets, but I just cleaned and reused them since I didn't have replacement parts handy. Okay, got it assembled back. Look how clean that is compared to before. I even cleaned all this grill here. Thick. My Lexus GS300 at 110 K miles had thick wet carbon sludge build up inside the platinum but this one was bone dry and there wasn't anything to clean inside so I just cleaned the outside. Because this is a port injection engine, the fuel is sprayed to the intake valves directly to minimize the carbon buildup. However, because the previous owner had done very little maintenance work on the engine area, except for changing the oil, 
Mass airflow sensor, throttle body, and spark plugs were one of the most dirtiest I've seen. Also, driving the car with heavy valve cover oil leak meant sometimes oil level was lower than normal. That all led to suboptimal conditions, and intact valves had more carbon buildup than I expected from a port injection engine. Using carbon removal spray through the air intake can help, but only as a repeated maintenance. But when you have a hard baked down carbon on intake valves like this, they can only be removed by scraping that off. Since the entire intake valve chambers were completely coated with black carbon, I used chem dip and long brush to scrub them and then wipe off the surface with clean paper towel. I repeated this perhaps half dozen times for each intake hole, so it took a couple of hours to finish. The intake valves were located quite deep, so it was really hard to do a thorough cleaning, but I scraped and cleaned as much carbon off as I can. And I temporarily plugged up the uh, intake valve so that it doesn't get contaminated in there. Usually after intake valve cleaning, I also like to clean the piston head carbon buildup. Therefore, I used a borescope camera to poke into cylinder chambers and they were surprisingly not too bad. So I passed on cleaning this, which will require another half day of work to soak the pistons with carbon cleaner for a few hours and then vacuuming out the remaining cleaning solutions, driving on highway speed for about 30 minutes to burn off any residues, and then changing the oil. Every single one of the ignition coil connectors broke. All three in the front and all three in the back. So. If you broke some connectors during this work, you can find the exact part number on the connector itself. All Toyota and Lexus electrical connectors start with 90980 prefix, and you can just find the remaining number on the connector itself. Here are some sample screenshots of various different locations where you can find the part number. I'm going to show you guys how to do one of them. So this kit that I bought, in case you want to splice the wire, they included this. And it comes with the uh, connector end with all the wires. So you can splice it. They even cut it for you here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the wires of the original. So the only thing I'm going to do is take out this connector end and then just replace that. I have a separate short video on how to find part numbers for all broken connectors for Toyota and Lexus cars and how to replace them. It's actually quite cheap and easy to do, so no need to pay someone hundreds of dollars for this simple work. I'll include the link to this video in the description section below. So I got three connector broken heads taken out and replaced. These with the uh, locking tabs. I gotta do the ones in the back. Okay, I got the back sides all fixed with the new locking tabs all replaced. Each one took maybe a couple minutes each. By the way, when you're doing this, make sure you cover the, uh, the camshaft, cam gear. It's important that you cover this area because if you drop something in here, I'll show you this long wire stick. You see, you see how deep that goes in. That's more than 12 inches. So you're not, you're not gonna be able to retrieve anything that you drop in there. As you can see, the fuel injector tips were pretty dirty and some of the tiny holes actually could be partially clogged. So I had ordered a fuel injector flush kit, but the delivery was delayed. So I tried to rig one up and it almost worked, but the force of the spray was just too hard to keep the aperture in place, no matter what I tried. But it did help to clean the fuel spray outlet areas. But just to be sure, I did some additional fuel injector tip cleaning. Look how the clean fuel injector tips are now. While at it, I also noticed that the o-rings were a bit worn and they were fitting somewhat loosely and I was concerned that highly pressurized fuel can actually leak 
after I assemble everything back together, or worse yet, it can cause fire. So I bought a set of four O-rings for about nine bucks, and since this is a six-cylinder car, I had to buy two sets for about 18 bucks from a local auto parts store. So I'm just gonna take that out and replace it. The thickness is about the same, but this one, the old one, is very, how you say, it's very soft, became very loose. The new one is more sturdy. So, yeah, fit that over there. Yeah, that one definitely is more tighter fit. I'm doing the back ones right now, but after I install the back, when I get to the front injectors, I'll also swap out the O-rings. All right, so this fuel injector area is a little bit contaminated. And also underneath the valve cover, you can see a lot of oil and sludge buildup. So I carefully cleaned out the fuel injector holes and then covered them with tape to prevent further contamination. And then I scrubbed with brush and cleaned off as much previous oil leak mess as possible. If you don't clean this, the problem is the next buyer or mechanic will suspect that you may have oil leak. And also it's not easy for you to tell if you have a fresh oil leak. So it's important to clean this. After cleaning all the oil leak mess, Finally, you can see the shiny silver color metal. So if you completely pop out all the fuel injectors, you can pull this back. And of course, you can haul this away this way. That's a fresh motor oil. I'm just going to dab some around the end of the new oil, new O-rings that I put on before I snap it back into the fuel rail. Once you have fuel injectors snapped back into the fuel rail, Next, we have to get the outlet side of the fuel injectors placed into the engine block. Okay, line up the injectors. Now you're gonna put a spacer and a washer. So, the spacer will go on the bottom. Actually, let me get all the spacers in there first. Okay, line up the injectors. And tighten it for now. And then this is the 12 millimeter that goes here. The PCV valve is located on top of the rear valve cover. I have a separate video on PCV valve replacement under a normal condition with nothing taken apart. But since you'll be removing the rear valve cover, this will be easy work. So I strongly recommend that you replace this cheap part that serves very important function. The first major benefit is properly functioning PCV reduces pressure inside of the engine compartment to minimize compromising internal gaskets that can cause oil and coolant leaks. The second benefit is unburned fuel is given another chance to combust cleanly, which reduces emissions in exhaust and minimizes contaminating and damaging the catalytic converter, which is very expensive to replace. The OEM PCV is only 10 to 12 bucks, so I recommend you get the Toyota OEM part for this. The previous owner had never replaced the PCV, so when you take it out and shake it, you don't hear any rattle which means it's clogged and it's not functioning properly. As I mentioned before, the previous owner had done the coolant flush recently, so I saved the coolant and I'm going to use it to refill it back. I lost about a quart of coolant while disconnecting coolant holes going to the throttle body, so I added a little more using this pink colored Xerox brand's Asian car coolant. When you refill the coolant, just remember that you need to run the engine to circulate the coolant for a few minutes with the radiator cap off, and this will allow some air bubbles to come out. 
This oil leak went on for several years, so there is a lot of oil sludge everywhere. And with all the parts removed, we can now clean the oil leak mess in areas that were previously hidden. Just get some old t-shirts and towels and wipe away as much oil sludge mess that has completely coated the engine. I clean from both top and bottom side of the engine. Though I'm gonna speed through this boring and laborious work, it took me several hours, which includes another phase of multiple soaking and cleaning with engine degreaser spray after everything was installed back. If you don't do this, hot engine will generate smoke and oil burning smell will come through to inside the cabin when you drive the car. Worse yet, the next buyer or mechanic will suspect that you have oil leak or you won't be able to easily find the next new fresh oil leak. With over 100 video recordings, the part 2 video is just getting too long, so I'll cut it here. As mentioned before, the part 1 video not only covered removing the valve covers, but all the other parts that also had to be removed first. In this part 2 video, I mainly focused on all the maintenance work that I performed with all the parts removed, since it's much, much, much easier to do now than with all the parts back together. In the next and final part 3 video, I'll go over reassembling all the parts back together, which had different challenges than removing parts shown in part 1 video. Thanks for watching, and I hope this was helpful, and I'll see you guys in part 3 video within 1 to 2 weeks.